I'll begin with you, Arshad, uh, because you come from a country uh, which is in a state of war right now. So, uh, and the war with non-state actors. Uh, so after the October attack, the Hamas attack, um, would you think or would you term it a global failure that um, there has been no coherent strategy to contain non-state actors? Well, I think that Israel right now is in the middle of a multi-front war. Uh, we are fighting, Israel is being attacked from seven different arenas, not only Hamas in Gaza. We have Hezbollah in Lebanon, we have uh, the Shia militias in Syria, the Houthis in Yemen, and also the, the terror uh, um, uh, you know, threat from the West Bank, uh, mostly by Hamas element. And all of these, uh, you know, the the... the the country that's shaking the curtains behind all of this is, of course, Iran. As part of its, uh, you know, strategy, uh, the uh, axis of resistance. And uh, I think that uh, what we see today is definitely a major failure of the world to understand the problem. Look what happened, for example, in the Red Sea. Take example, the Houthis example. You know, Iran is using its proxies. And if you look at the, at the Houthis and the relations with Iran, you know, uh, Iran relations to the Houthis is relatively new. It's very opportunistic. You know, the main core of Iran was Syria, was, uh, Syria, was Iraq, not Ye Yemen. And they were investing in, in Yemen in, in a way to get an additional outreach in the region. And in many ways for the Iranian, it was like a, uh, you know, a very modest investments in regional forces that uh, reject the status quo. Well, what the Houthis are now doing, they're trying to definitely show the military capabilities, their willingness to fight. They're trying to, uh, uh, in, in many ways, to leverage the negotiation status in, uh, with Saudi Arabia, increase their, their um, position in the eyes of their external patron, which is Iran. But in any case, I, I don't think there is no cause or grievance that justify the continuation of attack uh, that uh, disrupt the freedom of na navigation that affects global supply chain, uh, the global trade. And uh, I think the first thing we need to do is definitely address the radioactive she elephant in the room. And by doing this, uh, there's two ways, I, I believe there's two ways to, to tackle this uh, twofold uh, framework, which one of them is uh, direct actions against the uh, um, the proxies, for example, with the Houthis, look what's happening. I think we're still in very defensive mode when it comes to that. Uh, shooting on deserted dunes once in a while, that doesn't really mean taking an action. Um, every day, um, Japanese, British-owned uh, ships are being attacked. And it's not even just Israeli, uh, with Israeli connection. They even, nowadays they lost even the, the motivation to justify that it's related to Israel. Nowadays they're just attacking every ships. Uh, every day we see even Indian uh, cruise ships mm. being you know, kidnapped, hijacked. Um, so we need to do something about it. But the question is, what are you gonna do about it? Are we gonna um, think about a, a coalition, uh, an organization, a bigger platform that will fight terrorism. Do we have this need at this moment of what we see today? We mm -hmm. see that terrorism is affecting each and every one of it. It's not the war in the Middle East because, uh, you know, what the, the Houthis are doing right now in the Red Sea is affecting, it will affect everybody in the world when it comes to food prices, when it, when it comes to the good prices, everything will, will be affected. And if you see that we have to address also the octopus head, which is Iran. You know, we can't, uh, you know, one should not think that just direct action against the, you know, the non-state actor will be enough. We have to do something about the sponsoring states. And Iran is one of them. If we will not do something about mm. it, definitely Iran will continue to challenge the, the international system and of course the West. So, so it's a global war which isn't ending. Mm -hmm. War on Terror. Uh, Max, I'm going to come to you. You're the author of uh, Rules for Rebels, The Science of Victory in Military History, uh, Study of Terrorism and Insurgency. And what Oshrit was saying was it's not just non-state actors. There is This element has more than uh, that. How do you see a strategy forming globally? Or do you see it happening at all? So I want to make a comparison between how the world especially, but not limited to the United States, responded to 9-11 compared to the international response to Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, the attack on October 7th. In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, 
there was tremendous cohesion internationally and within the United States around the very basic idea that terrorism is bad <laughs> and that the world should do everything possible to counter the terrorists. There were a lot of mistakes made after 9-11, particularly with the Iraq war. There was some overreaction in terms of civil liberties with it inside of the United States. But the basic premise that terrorism was bad and that we should support the leaders of our countries in order to you know, destroy this threat was, was highly prevalent. And I think that I actually took it for granted because I've been appalled by the international response to Operation Alexa Flood. In the United States, never did I see pro-Al-Qaeda rallies yeah. after 9-11. You certainly didn't see them, um, you know, mobs of thousands of people in the streets with signs of foreign terrorist organizations as designated by the U.S. State Department. You didn't have people calling for Antifada, not just around in, in distant countries, but locally, the global Antifada. There is presently incitement inside the United States and many other Western countries like Canada, like uh, Australia, uh, Western European countries and London and Paris and all of these major cities, you have large numbers of overt terrorist supporters. It is not uncommon to see big posters with Hamas leaders being shown. And so there is, there's the opposite of a international counterterrorism coalition or consensus. What you increasingly see is more visible signs that large segments of these populations, somehow tolerated by the police forces, are advocating for the terrorists. If you go to New York City right now, you're not going to see as many sort of pro-Israel signs as you will see pro-Houthi signs. This is New York City. Um, so I've been very much appalled by the reaction. And I do think it's deeply concerning, not just for the fate of Israel, not just for the fate of the Jewish diaspora, but for the fate of democracies more broadly, that they are so tinged by this kind of radicalization, which only seems to grow. And frankly, the terrorists couldn't hope for a better response. So, Shanti, I'm going to come to you. We've spoken about 9-11. We've spoken about the October uh, 2023 attack by non-state actors. But you and I live in a country which has seen that for decades. We've seen that in Kashmir and we kept talking about it. Um, and this eulogizing uh, terrorists in, in Western nations, we have seen uh, how Hurriyat pictures were everywhere, how they were uh, fated in, in Western democracies. They were called for conferences like this one. Uh, they were invited and uh, asked to speak on human rights abuses in Kashmir. And they were the ones who were doing the human rights abuses. The world did not sit up till 2611 happened. That was, and even after that, uh, Kashmir kept seeing terrorism happen. So this liberalized, liberal democracy standing up uh, to non-state actors, do you see that happening at all? No, I don't. In fact, uh, I see Osama bin Laden winning. It's as simple as that. Uh, and for me, it was quite shocking, apart from all the demonstrations we've seen in Western capitals, uh, where villains are actually being made into victims. Uh, for me, it was shocking to see suddenly that trend start off, that letter of Osama bin Laden hmm. to the United States and all the so-called young people, you know, say that Osama was such a great thinker. The guy was a mass murderer and suddenly you are putting him on some kind of a pedestal. You've got to be completely off your mind to be doing something like this. 
But again, then when you speak about the Indian experience, I think the problem with this fight on terrorism is there's no clarity on how to fight this. Hmm. We're talking about non-state actors. These are not non-state actors. These are not para-state actors. These are more than a state. Uh, we're talking about the Houthis, for example. Even if the Iranians were to pull out support tomorrow, Houthis have their own agency. Uh, what are what about the international system that everybody, you know, we keep going to conferences and we keep hearing about rules-based order. Nobody ever answers who's going to enforce the rules. And the rules become fungible that if I don't like somebody, I'm going to ignore, uh, you know, uh, what somebody else is, what a terrorist organization is doing out there. If I like somebody, I'll weigh in. And when you start having these kind of standards, then suddenly, you know, things, then it's every man for himself. So you, we haven't been able to uh, forge a kind of a sustained and systematic effort against this, this menace. Secondly, I don't think we understand it adequately. We don't understand the kind of death cult many of these terrorists belong to. They, they revel in death. So if supposing you want to take out and, and the Houthis are affecting, it is a global problem now, right? It's not limited to a local yeah. area. Now, if they're doing what they're doing, and I agree that if you're going to go and bomb a few camel tents, and as George Bush very uh, loose, in one of his moments, he said very lucidly that, look, I'm not going to use a $10 million missile to bomb out a $10 tent. But that's what you're going to be doing with these guys, with many of these guys. Even if you're taking out their batteries, they've got the kind of technologies which are so disruptive that they can hold the entire global economy or at least a substantial part of it hostage. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to start enforcing these rules? Yeah, Iran might be one answer, but we haven't really understood how to fight this at an ideological level, at, at the level of building up narratives of saying that this is not acceptable. And for example, on the October 7th attacks, it was horrific what happened. And yet, suddenly it is all about what's happening in Gaza, not about what provoked those attacks. Hmm. Uh, and it's that, you know, why are you overreacting? Now, what is an overreaction? At what point of time does a reaction become an overreaction? Nobody adequately explains this, you know. So these are... These are familiar tropes which are used by the so-called left liberal lobby, no, no, which is dominant. No, it's not just left liberal. I have seen even diplomats, uh, Indian diplomats also talk what about this. What makes you think they're not left liberal? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've seen uh, retired Indian diplomats also say that uh, they there should be some restraint, maybe allow humanitarian aid uh, use channels and that's how it can become acceptable. But right now what's happening in Gaza becomes unacceptable it becomes difficult for even even the liberals to support so the problem is that look it's all okay to hmm. talk about a humanitarian or aid corridor but have you thought this through who's going to monitor that aid how is that aid going to be distributed is that aid going to go into the hands of the organization against which the fight is taking place uh, is it going to them uh, you keep talking about and and again you know you 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 kind of jumble up things when you sit when you try and equate what Hamas did on October 7th with the Israeli reaction, I don't think there is any evidence as yet that the Israelis are deliberately targeting civilians. Hmm. And yet this entire propaganda is, and we don't know where those numbers are coming from, but 20, every five, uh, every five days targeted. or so, yes, about a thousand happens, people yeah. are added, right? Yeah. And this is crazy. Nobody is willing to question the numbers. Nobody is willing to question who is going to monitor things. Nobody is willing to say that, okay, fine. Hamas is the villain out here. It needs to be, you know, held accountable. It needs to be taken down. Why isn't anybody talking about it? And why is, and, and I'm glad the Indian foreign minister spoke about it the other day. At the Munich conference. Yeah. When yeah. he said that, look, why is the release of the hostages not an important issue? Why is it not a critical issue? Mm. So, you know, it's it's the way this whole thing has been obfuscated, which, which for anybody who's been studying terrorism and the way it's been growing, uh, it's very galling because, and frankly speaking, what the Americans did after 9-11, they should have been smarter about what they did. 
But what we are now seeing is that the global footprint of these organizations has actually spread. It's not got constricted. Okay. We might have we might have constricted it in Syria, huh. but then it's expanded throughout the whole of Sahel. Uh, we might have limited it in some other quarter, but then it's expanded somewhere else. It's like so, that balloon which keeps, you know, you press at one end, it blows balloon up and another octopus. End. That's yeah. what it's coming to. Or should I I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to uh, add to what Sushant was mentioning, how the world should handle the and combat uh, terrorism. But I feel like when we use the, you know, the word word in this context, like, what are we referring to? The world not necessarily has the interest to fight terrorism. There are a few countries basically that use terrorism and crime as their instru a national instrument. Mm. So there is no global will for that. There are a few countries in the West that, and also in this part of the world, and India is included in that list, that want to fight this phenomena. What the world needs to do is prioritize international cooperation. We need to enhance uh, um, intelligence sharing and also enforce some economic and diplomatic measures. And in my eyes, um, Intelligence sharing is the most is the critical one because by uh, if countries will share intelligence, we'll know more about. Uh, we'll be able to track their financing, their their training, the logistical support uh, provided by the state sponsor for these non-state actors, and by that we'll be able to disrupt the terrorist networks and also hold the sponsor accountable. Second thing, which is most important, is the diplomatic pressure. We need to use targeted sanctions, diplomatic sanction, diplomatic isolation to make sure and use all the diplomatic channels to utilize and make sure that to convey the message that there will be a clear and very strict consequences for supporting terrorism. That's what the war needs to do. And unfortunately, if you look what what's happening in the war in Gaza, you see, seems like Iran find the ultimate formula to act through its proxies without even paying a price for its behavior. That's what is going on right now. And what we need to do is I, I feel like the world needs to, first of all, recognize the threat and be courageous enough to act and do something against it. Mm -hmm. uh, Max, let me come to you. Uh, when we talk about the world coming up with strategies uh, to combat terrorism, one, uh, unless you, when you're, when you say war, you should know who the enemy is. And my enemy is not necessarily the enemy of, say, the UK. Uh, so if you want to do intelligence sharing, for example, against the Hamas, uh, they may not do it because street is dictating terms to the, uh, to the state in many of these countries. So why will they share intelligence? Why will they do economic blockade? Why will they put diplomatic effort when there are street protests? by tens of thousands of people in support of Hamas? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that the truth is Hamas is quite popular and the Jews are not. And this is not just true about Jews in Israel, it's Jews in the diaspora. You know, when... when not in India. No, not in India. You've in, talked about Indi that. Yes. India is a very rare exception. Um, I'm a huge India fan. I think India is one of the very few countries that actually, rhetoric aside, genuinely prioritizes counterterrorism. India is a very strong ally, both of the United States and of Israel. I think that there are, frankly, a lot of similarities between India and Israel um, in terms of the industriousness of the people, in terms of also their view towards counterterrorism. Um, so I'm definitely appreciative of India's role in this, including uh, the Modi governments. I think but, uh, I just but, but But there really isn't going to be threat sharing, intel sharing mm. in cases where there isn't a consensus around who the terrorists are. Um, yeah. And so for, for, for Hamas, this is a insurmountable problem. Um, and it was, I guess, a little bit easier after 9-11 where Al-Qaeda was, you know, reviled by many different countries. But increasingly what you're seeing, because I've drawn this distinction a couple times now between 9-11 and Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, but increasingly you're actually seeing an overlap in the nature of these threats. Hamas was never considered a 
major player or even a player, some would argue, within the global jihad. Hamas terrorism operated differently. Hamas itself has um, prosecuted um, jihadists within Gaza, and its ideology is um, somewhat objectionable to uh, Salafis um, because of its support for nationalism, its participation in elections. But after October 7th, Al-Qaeda no longer cared. Um, numerous mm. Al-Qaeda branches came out within a couple days praising Hamas. And the, the Hamas agenda has been adopted by these more traditional players within the global jihad. Al-Qaeda now, when it talks about committing attacks, talks about attacking the Jews. Um, there is a greater emphasis now on attacking the Jews out of solidarity with Hamas. And the same is also true of Islamic State. And so when you see mobs of people in the West supporting Hamas, by extension, they are lending support now for the broader global jihad. I view them as friendly with Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And for that reason, Hamas truly is a threat to India, the threat to the West, a true international threat because of its leadership position that it has assumed over the past several months. A defeat, or as close as we can get to that, a huge blow against Hamas in Gaza, a successful operation in Rafah will not only harm Hamas, it will also harm Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. We should all be rooting for that, but unfortunately, many in the West are not. Can so I just add something? Yeah, sure. You know, it's very important for people to understand, and this is one of the big failures in the war on these on on terrorists. That there is this constant hair splitting. Uh, that you know, the ideology of one group is different from the other. One mm. group belongs to one doctrine, school of doctrine. The other is from another theological stream. You know, they'll have their differences. But if you look at every single terror group from Morocco to the Moro Islands in Philippines, there is a single continuum in them. They, they are coming from the same ideological stream. Their minor differences is what the MNCs would call, you know, uh, think, uh, act local, think global. <laughs> that's, that's the ideology, basically. That's how they are all operating. So if Hamas has suddenly become the leadership role, if tomorrow you decimate Hamas, some other group will become, hmm. will carry out a very audacious action and will become heroes. So the point is that until and unless you're not going to strike at the root from where this is arising, you're not going to get a solution. Hmm. And there are, look, so for example, if the Saudis were taking action against the Houthis. What did the West do? Today, suddenly everybody is waking up that Houthis are the bad guys, they're a terrorist organization. The poor Saudis and the Emiratis were trying to clean it up. Okay, maybe they botched it up. They didn't clean it up properly. Maybe they, they didn't have a real uh, battle plan on how to go about it. But the fact is that they were starting to act. And what did the West do? They kind of came down on them like a ton of bricks. All the New York Times and others were publishing story after story about this great humanitarian tragedy. Yes, there was a humanitarian tragedy taking place in Yemen, but it wasn't of the making of the Saudis and the Emiratis, hmm. right? And yet they were pilloried. Now suddenly everybody is running for cover because now the Americans want to bomb the Houthis. Mm. The Brits want to do it. Everybody else wants to do it. And the Saudis and the Emiratis are saying, okay, go now ahead. Now it's yeah, Go ahead, do it. Because, yeah. you know, when we were trying to clean it up, that time you guys were, you know, dissing us. So there is this basic fundamental problem which is, I think, preventing and which is allowing these guys to actually grow so much bigger. And you name the place, they're there. And it's you know, spreading at an alarming speed. Uh, Oshit mentioned, uh, I'm going to come to you, but Oshit mentioned uh, going after finances. Now, that is one way of doing it. First was that you can't, you don't know who the enemy is. So first you find out who the enemy is. You've said how it can be done. 
going after the finances. Now, we've seen what's happened with FATF, right? You take one organization or you take one country, which is terror supporting country. It goes from gray to pink to lavender to black. It just goes into various colors. That's all we have seen. There is no teeth in FATF. They just don't take the action. So how does one go with the legal aspect to See, it? So FATF is number one, a somewhat informal organization, not mm. really a... Because it has no teeth, it has no enforcing mechanism. But I agree, financing is an extremely important part of, of, yeah. of you know, uh, cracking down on terrorism. But it's just one of the conditions. It's a necessary condition, but not the only necessary condition. There are a number of other conditions that have mm. to be put in place for it all to be working together. So if you're only going to focus on financing, so for example, for the longest in India, our attitude was that go after the weapons. You know, the weapons are important because that's what causes violence. Financing doesn't matter. Suddenly, we woke up to the fact that financing creates a terror ecosystem. We've seen that in Kashmir. Now, the good thing which this current government has started doing is cracking down on financing. That does not mean that they've, they're they not going after the weapons. They, sure. That does not mean they're not going after the organizational structures. Hmm. That does not mean they're not going after the rest of the ecosystem, you know, the schools and other things that organizations like the jamaat e islami and others had set up. They're going after all of it, but they're going after the financing as well. And once you start cutting off the financial stream, a lot of things start falling in place. But it all has to be done together. You can't go after one and say, okay, fine, if I do this, the rest will mm. fall in place. So I think, at least in India, to a great extent, that, uh, that realism on how to tackle this problem has come. And we still haven't gone the distance. There's mm. still a lot more that we need to do before we get over it. But at least we're starting to get there. Okay. I don't know about the West. I think they're losing the battle. I want to ask yes, you sure. Was saying, um, you know, I think one of the problems, he was talking about financing, is the definition, how we would define a state sponsoring terror. terror. So um, is Qatar is a sponsoring terror state? Mm. Uh, because according to their investments in US, they're not. So how you would define it? That's the number one rule. You have mm. to understand, is Qatar a sponsor? Is it? Yeah, you should have. Mm. The U.S. list of state sponsors of terrorism is a complete joke. So the only members are Syria, Iran, and North Korea. The list should obviously be expanded, and Qatar should be the first new country admitted, but not the last. I agree with you. Um, the problem isn't a failure to come up with some definition of terrorism. As a professor, my focus is on terrorism. And, you know, if you study terrorism at any other university in the United States or many other countries, you're going to be looking at the same groups, the same terrorists, the same data, we do have a shared understanding of what terrorism is. Governments are just loath to acknowledge who the terrorists are, not because there isn't a definition, but because they don't want to harm themselves geopolitically. Um, but frankly, it we would be much better off if governments adopted the same definition as terrorism scholars. Does uh, Israel feel that uh, it has lost the war of narratives? Uh, is it that the you know that they are feeling uh, that the street in in UK, that the street in uh, the US, they are determining determining what the narrative on the Israel Hamas conflict is? No, I think Israel is very um, you know proud of its effort to defend its citizens. Mm. Uh, we don't care what other people in the streets are thinking. When people are coming to shoot at your family and, you know, kidnapping them from home, I think the people who talk about idealism and stuff, they don't, they haven't seen that, you know, close enough. Yes. That's what I feel. And I, I don't think it, it is a problem. I think we are concerned from the rise of anti-Semitism, which is, I think, uh, the situation right now is, is the worst since the uh, you know, 30s of uh, the previous century. So we are concerned about that with the rise of anti-Semitism in the world because of October 7th, yes. what it's, you know, caused. But, you know, every country fight, uh, when you fight a war, it's a barbaric game 
we have to understand that you can't win the narrative. And of course, if you, um, uh, you know, dealing with an ag aggressor, play the victim. Uh, we are aware it's not something new for uh, to Israelis. We have a Hasbara group of uh, public diplomacy groups that are trying to fight this phenomena in American campuses for the last decade. Uh, we are aware of it, but we're fighting with a uh, bigger octopus, I would say, like Qatar funding, Saudi Arabia funding. So those are the things that we are concerned at the moment. Mm. How we stop this? Uh, how did India win the war of narratives? If India has won the war of narratives in dealing with terrorism uh, uh, in Kashmir, uh, can other countries learn from that? Like, can Israel learn that you need to fight that too? Or you just don't need to? First, you need to win on the ground. And then the narratives can follow. How should democracies rethink about fighting terrorism? Have we won the war of narratives? I don't know. I'm, I'm don't a little know. I'm confused. Asking, yes. I, I'm, I'm a little conflicted on that count. Uh, to some the extent... Reason, like maybe after Article 370, it was like, we're going to be doing this. We're going to be bringing normalcy in Kashmir. And Article 370 is how we're going, doing away with Article 370 is how we're going to be doing with that. And that if that meant putting people in their homes, keeping them in lockups for a period of time, not allowing street protests to happen. It didn't matter that the rest of the world said, oh, you've shut down uh, internet. Remember, so, that became so, a big so, story. So here is the thing. And, and again, you can't compare situations. Hmm. So yes, when we went ahead and did what we did, uh, frankly, we had the same attitude as Israel had that we are going to do this regardless of what anybody else says. Yeah. Yes, we will engage everybody, but we will press home our point uh, and, and we'll press it home very, very emphatically, just like Israel is doing. But there's a difference. Uh, and one difference is that in the case of Israel, uh, the response from Israel has, it's a warlike situation, right? Uh, and you've seen... Uh, certain scenes of destruction, you've seen bombardment, you've seen all kinds of violence taking place. And how that plays out as far as the uh, narrative building is concerned is very different from somebody saying, okay, fine, internet is out for six months. Fine, there's going to be curfew. If there's any major uh, law and order problem, we're going to impose a curfew the civilian casualties or any casualty in Kashmir after the constitutional reforms was was virtually nothing. If right? I take you back a little bit, uh, this was televised. This this attack by non-state actors, if, if we say non-state actors, if we call Hamas non-state actors, this was televised and it seemed gruesome. Uh, absolute, it was gruesome, but it was because it was te televised, it came to the homes of everybody around the world. Nobody was untouched by it. But that kind of gruesome attack, that kind of cross-border terrorism did happen for decades on end in Kashmir. We saw yeah, that it look, was not televised. But, but, look Tell at me it. The, no, one second. Yeah. Hamas televised it because they knew that the constituency they are addressing would love it. Hmm. And they lapped it up. Right? So would the lashkar e and, 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 if they but, had but, but once internet it's, No, then. once it kind of turned around and a lot of other people expressed horror, they simply denied it. All the footage in the world has come from Hamas cameras. Yeah. Right? No, it, it's not no. some CCTV camera. Cam no. cam it is all body cams these guys were wearing and they were live streaming it and they were showing it to the world what they have done. A lot of people lapped it up. Hamas became instantly a global celebrity for the people who adhere to its way of thinking. Uh, it became a superpower. Marks on, right? uh, on the dark web, they, they must have become heroes after Forget that. dark web. They it's became strange. heroes on Twitter it, it, and on... It you is, name it the, is true. Jordan, there had like there a was this paradoxical <laughs> reaction where... Oh, sorry, what did you say? I said in Jordan, you would find a, a new restaurant called uh, October oh, right. 7. Yeah. That was uh, all over. Oh, the people news. celebrated it. Celebrated it. So sorry. Yeah, I but like, I mean, it, it's, it's very um, odd what Hamas did because Hamas use their GoPro systems to capture the atrocities that they committed. They then returned to Gaza with, you know, 140 hostages or whatever, and were greeted um, as heroes and passed out candy. And then just by the OGWs, ju just by the local population. So that they become Gaza. overground workers. And, and, and then, um, 
within just like a couple of days, basically denied what they did, even though they had captured it for everybody to see. And to this day, many Hamas supporters have followed this narrative and now deny that many of the atrocities, which we saw just a few months ago, you know, ever happened. So mm-hmm. what's surprising the about that? 9-11, uh, oh, well, well, they, they, they carried out 9-11, right? Uh, <laughs> there, there's, there's all yeah, evidence, talk, there's, there's yeah. including tapes of Osama bin Laden celebrating. Yeah. But you ask the guys, and you still have 9-11 deniers. You still have people who say, and you go to Pakistan, you will have all kinds of people say, but you know, there were 2,000 Jews who were working in that building. They all were not there that day. So, you know, this kind of nonsense... Is, yeah, is urban con- legends, is, is, of course. Yeah, you know, it's all yeah. it's all over the place. So I think there is there is this huge problem. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason, why do you think ISIS was burning alive people and televising it? It's supposed to be popular. It's, it's suppo- I, I don't know. It, they I, I, I think it's a definition of terror. No, yeah, terrorist. but I think Sorry, it's depraved. Uh, no, terrorism. This is exactly what they're doing. This no, is terrorism. But, no, to- I, we might call it terrorism, yeah. but in... In, in that ecosystem, it's not. It's, it's the heroism. popular system. It's, 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 it's a very popular thing to do. It's, I do, it's depraved. I, yeah, of course. Sure. But I think the way they project it, wh- what do you think was making ISIS so popular? Yeah. Why was ISIS getting people from what eighty countries making a beeline to join them? Uh, they were. They had taken the world back. What fifteen hundred years? And it the, will these tapes and these visuals. Uh, will cause this self-radicalization happening in towns and villages across the globe. It kind yeah, of, I mean, you, you can't even, I mean, just in terms of the numbers, Hamas's popularity is way greater than ISIS's um, ever was. Uh, Hamas is even popular among government officials. Hamas is popular in the media. Hamas is popular within higher education. Hamas is popular among kindergarten teachers, it has been normalized to be a Hamas supporter in the way that ISIS never was. The reason why we think ISIS was popular was because it had a big digital footprint and because of its location was able to attract a lot of foreign fighters. Um, But because of Gaza's position uh, where Egypt is no friend of the Muslim Brotherhood and Gaza of course has abutted by Israel, it makes foreign fighters um, getting in much, much harder. But if Hamas was operating in a country that was more open towards foreign fighters, I wouldn't be surprised if you find a bunch of American professors running there tomorrow. (laughs) Uh, That that leads me to the question, how and when the war on terror will end, if it's going to end somewhere. You asked me this earlier, and I think that, you know, it will not end uh, sooner as the West expected it to end after 9-11. I think what we're going to see, the current campaign against terrorism will be nasty, br- British, and long. You see that, uh, yeah, and you see that the attacks, the the kind of attacks that terrorists uh, will use, they will use sophisticated weapons. We, we're talking about germs, warfare, radioactive weapon, if not nuclear weapon. So, if you ask me, and you see right, right now, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, I, I, ISIS, they're all growing in numbers. And their connections also with criminal or- organizations are on the rise. So, you know, I, I feel like in order to really like fight terrorism, we need to fight. I don't know when and how it's going to end, but I know we might fight it uh, with vigor, with dedication. We must do it wisely. You know, um, Philip Gordon wrote a really nice article uh, for Foreign Affairs in 2007, says when and uh, the war on terror will end. And he said that eventually all, all war ends. Uh, and he said that the factors that driving the, the international uh, system are so numerous and so fluid, so no um, political system uh, or conflict can last forever. And we can just look at history, look at the Cold War, uh, you know, how the Cold War ended. It ended not when the uh, U.S. Army occupied the Kremlin. It was when the occupant le- abandoned the Kremlin. Mm. So when they stopped believing in this ideology. So of course we must fight terrorism with all our means to protect our citizens, including military power. But at the same time, the only way to fight this uh, jihadist terrorist, uh, terror is by 
you know, when the ideology that underpins it will lose its appeal. Hmm. That's what, this is eventually we must be aware of it. So, so these people also have. Let me say two provocative things. <laughs> One pushback. <clears throat> The reason why ISIS was not as popular as Hamas is today, and I don't mean to be mean or anything, ISIS was killing Muslim and Muslim, right? Hamas is killing Muslim and Jew. It's a no-brainer, right? So among the guys who love these guys, of course, Hamas will be more popular. But on the other point, you know, the problem why I... I am uh, very pessimistic about in this in this fight on against terrorism is because, frankly, the global system or the international system as we know it is unraveling. Hmm. It's breaking down. We don't know what it's going to be replaced with. Uh, we're still trying to find our feet on it. Uh, and even the system as it exists today, uh, it just doesn't have that kind of stomach to fight this fight the way yeah. it needs to be fought. This right? is why intellectually just... or or militarily. It's one thing to go and you know send a couple of planes and bomb something and come back. That that's 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 a microcosm of what you need to do, mm. right? There's lot so much more that you need to do. So when this international system is going to start unraveling as it is, many of these terror organizations and parastate organizations are actually going to find their space increase. Okay, it's not going to reduce. So I am. S certainly not as optimistic as you seem to be that one day, you know, a new day will dawn and we will see, I've seen the end of terrorism. You know, I want to end this session like a Bollywood movie and you know, hope for hope and hope peace hope. and, right? Peace so and that peace and goodwill and let's end with the song instead of thinking that 2023 is not going to be a year of peace. It's going to be a year of tumult. 2024, yeah, 24 I'm sorry, already. 2024 is going to be a year of tumult. 2023 saw action. 2024 is the... I think you can write off the decade of the 20s, starting from 2020, COVID. COVID to... To, to what is happening now. And one had now, thought that there would be no wars or something. It seems like the never-ending phase of wars. Keep your fingers crossed. If you pass the 2020s, you might stay alive for longer. Otherwise, <laughs> you're yeah. not going to see the 2030s. Okay. There, there, there's tends to be a lot of pessimism around counterterrorism. Americans think about what happened in Afghanistan and obviously the Taliban would continue to thrive. Americans think about the intervention in Iraq, um, which in some ways contributed to more terrorism actually. But there are historical examples of terrorist groups being just absolutely taken apart. Um, the Islamic State is currently a shadow of what it was. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is much less robust than it used to be. India itself has had previously a much bigger Khalistani terrorism problem than it does now. India has scored some major successes there. Um, in South America, the shining path of Peru. Nobody talks about them anymore, right? Yeah. Look at the foreign terrorist organization list. Go back in history. Many of those groups are no longer around or they're much, much weaker. I think that if Israel is allowed to take its gloves off, pursue its mission in Rafa, give it three months, do everything that they can to get civilians out of the way, Hamas could if if Israel is allowed to do that, Hamas will never be the same organization. So let me. Yeah, but that I, doesn't end the problem, does it? But the first and it foremost, is the Hamas we need problem. to. Yeah, yeah, first and foremost yeah. is that the 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 hostages need to come back home, and at least in that sphere, let's hope that in this year we can see that happen. So on that note, thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you very much, Arshad. Hope. Uh, you have a better impression about New Delhi <laughs> rather than, uh, you know, a uh, uh, dummy upset because of <laughs> Delhi. Of Hopefully when we meet next year at the Raisina Dialogue, we'll have we'll better... We'll still be alive. Yeah. <laughs> we'll still be alive yeah. and discuss a better situation. Better situation. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.